Hello everyone, welcome to What's Doing, your go-to destination for insightful Malaysian content conversations with the movers and shakers of the Malaysian entertainment world. I'm your host, Abid Hussain, founder CEO of Creators 2, a creative content company, and today's episode is set to be a remarkable one. Joining us in the studio is a figure who has been a game changer in the Malaysian film and television scene, Alfie Palermo. Alfie's contribution to the industry are phenomenal. A celebrated scriptwriter, an innovative filmmaker, and a visionary in the truest sense. From captivating audiences with his compelling storytelling to challenging the norms of traditional filmmaking, Alfie has not just created art but has also inspired a new wave of creative thinking. His projects like One Cent Thief and Dukundiva has set new benchmarks in the industry. At the same time, his rebellious approach to filmmaking has made him a beloved figure among the young and aspiring filmmakers. Thank you, Alfie, for joining us for this podcast. And uh, we are very, very thankful for you to, to join in today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, just want to know what is your creative process in script writing? Okay, so uh, as far as my creative process is, I think it's something that was developed over the years. So I started off uh, around 2007. I was 27 at the time and had no idea how to do it. So you sort of get into this business not knowing how to do things, right? And then you start looking at references. So the first show that I actually did was a kid's drama. It was for Astro, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I had to study like, I didn't know how to write scripts. I had no idea how to do it. So I just watched uh, cartoons. I watched uh, TV shows that were almost similar. And I start, sort of like reverse engineered what what was being done in those shows and you know, started learning how to write. So that was how it started. But right now, to where it's gotten, I think, uh, I'm not, not to say that I know everything or I know <laughs> a lot about writing. All I have right now is a certain method that works maybe for me, right? So the method is something like, uh, I figure out first what the premise of the story is. And then from there, I try to figure out what it means. So I, I sort of try and get what the theme of the story is. And then I build the characters and the structure and the plot and everything around that theme. So it's got to like represent, it's got to represent what the, a story basically needs to represent what the, the theme is, what it's all about, the idea, the idea behind the story. Yeah, that's the process. So how, do you approach developing these compelling stories for film or for, for, for television? Well, it requires um, a lot of time, <laughs> firstly, and it's just that. It's just identifying what is this story trying to say. So you can, it can be any kind of story, right? So it's, you can tell a story about a haunted house or a family that's trapped in a haunted house. It can be anything, you know, a bit. But the point is, what is this story really trying to say? So you kind of got to zero in on that first. And the moment you zero in on that, you kind of start building all of the character profiles and everything based off of that. So I go by that sort of, uh, that's the way I sort of approach writing. It needs to have some sort of objective and directive. So it's not just simply, you know, writing stuff and not knowing what the direction is. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, it's pretty much structure, how you work as your structure. Yeah, it it's works just the you. way that, yeah, that yeah. I work. Yeah. So what are, what are some of your key inspiration and influences when it comes to script writing and filmmaking? Okay, so I would say um, Aaron Sorkin, definitely one of the writers that I really love. Filmmaking, well, too many actually, to be honest. But I, uh, too many actually. But people always ask what are the influences as far as filmmaking and writing is concerned. I like to go back to what filmmaking and writing actually is, which is really it's the art of telling a story, right? So if you ask me in terms of influences, it, it's actually more literary than it is film. I mean, film has, it has its own visual language and stuff, right? But story, as far as story is concerned, I mean, it's all literary. So. Um, I'm thinking someone like Stephen King, for example, right? So he's a, he's a very successful mainstream writer, sold millions of books. And yet, I don't find many people 
who can tell a story like Stephen King. So the characters are so well formed and the emotions, it, there's an emotional takeaway every time you read a Stephen King novel, right? So it's those things that I find interesting and I find, I find it fun if I watch films or TV shows that are able to do that. It gives you some sort of emotional takeaway. That's, that's from, from a worldview, from, from a Hollywood perspective. Yeah. But what, 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 what kind of uh, you know, inspiration you have from, from a Malaysian context? From a Malaysian context, I would say uh, definitely, for example, the works of Lat. So of all the storytellers that I have encountered uh, in this country, I would probably say my favorite would probably be Lat. Datuk Lat, the cartoonist, yeah. right? So when he tells a story, it's just his, his observations of the world around him. So if you've read Lat, right, Abed? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my father, for example, he, my, my late father, he was Filipino. So he came to Malaysia, right, married my mom. And his point of reference for Malaysia, because he didn't, he didn't understand what Malaysia was, right? His point of reference was the Lat comic books. Town Boy, Kampung Boy, that's how he learned about Malaysia. And growing up, my house was full of lap comics because my dad was trying to understand what Malaysia was all about. And the moment I read lap, it's like, oh my God, he, he's got it. He hits all the points. Like he understands the world around him, his own observations of the world around him. It's, it's beautiful. He gets it. He captures Malaysian life. Like, that, that's be good because that's, that's the grassroots level of means I have also read Lath and he gets it. He basically makes one month's trip and you, he tells a story which is deep yeah. down in, in correct, not many correct. layers, you know. True. So yeah, that's that obviously Lath, uh, I would say, is one of the best uh, we have. Um, from your perspective, how has the Malaysian film and television industry evolved in recent years where script writing and storytelling con is concerned? I think it's evolved only because there are so many platforms out there right now that's hungering for content. And therefore, like for example, back then there were only a couple of TV stations. So the way the Malaysian film and TV industry works, you've got the film side, which releases films, uh, X number of films a year. And uh, you've got the TV side, which is uh, TV dramas mostly. Uh, content, all kinds of content, scripted and unscripted uh, programs. So we used to have like probably only three, three terrestrial TV channels. We still have until today, right? So, but suddenly Astro came along and then uh, now we've got OTT, we've got View, uh, Netflix, Amazon and, and, and the like. And what this has done is that it's, we see suddenly that there are all these spaces to tell stories and there's this huge appetite and a huge hunger for content and that needs to be filled right now. So yes, there has been an evolution in terms of the demand and supplying that demand is now the challenge. So you see the writers need to now uh, sort of uh, buckle up because <laughs> you've got all these opportunities and yet, you know, it's still a very small pool of writers to be honest that does all these OTT shows. The, the pool of writers, I think at this yeah. point of time, are very limited. We're writing great stuff. So I think that that pool has to increase for it sure. It has to increase, yeah. true. Switching on to a little bit more serious topic is that in your experience, uh, how has Finas contributed to the development of script writers and filmmakers in Malaysia? Okay, so in terms of Finas, um, I myself actually went to a film school that was under Finas. It was Academy Film uh, Malaysia. This was way back then. Uh, amongst our alumni are people like Bron Palari, the actor, Osman Ali, the director. We've got uh, directors of photography like Raja Mukris, who's also a director as well. Uh, a lot of people came uh, who are now working in the, in the industry did come from Academy Film. So I was one of them. So uh, yeah. In terms of the contribution, there have been programs that have been designed to, to sort of contribute to the, to the overall ecosystem, uh, the whole uh, filmmaking ecosystem uh, in terms of contributing manpower and training. So yes, Finas has done a lot of that, I think. But it'll be, it's now interesting to see where that direction is heading because you don't have a 
film academy anymore. Now, now they don't have one. They do have training programs. I do feel that the training programs may have to be de developed further. I think uh, a bit more focus perhaps on understanding storytelling. Because a lot of these programs, right, say for example, you've got a workshop for cinematography, for example, right? And it's very technical, you see a bit? So it's instead of it being more story skewed, like for example, um, you can read an issue of American Cinematographer, that's that magazine, right? And they're all interviews with DOPs, uh, with uh, cinematographers, Conrad Hall, all these people, uh, Janice Kaminsky, all these guys. And whenever you read a, an interview with an American director of photography, they're always talking about the stories. They're not, they're not really talking about, okay, I, I built this camera rig and I did this whole lighting rig. I mean, that's true, they did yeah. build all kinds of technology and stuff. But whenever they do interviews about the work that they've done, it's always about, okay, I shot this because the character and the story demands this, this, this. You see, so it's very story skewed. And I believe that if the programs, the training programs that Finas or anyone has, is more skewed to story, then we'll start seeing that all of the different departments in filmmaking, audio, uh, even wardrobe and everything, it, everyone's here to tell one story, you know. So it's not just, okay, I know my mics and I know my, my technique. It's true, you, you, got, you got to develop those technical skills. But it needs to be skewed to an objective and that objective is definitely story. Because you see this in, say, great films. Like in great films, right? Everyone is there playing a part and it's, it's everyone working in one direction, you see. And that direction is, the story, like, we're just trying to tell a story here, right? Everybody ha has a common goal and everybody wants to achieve that goal. Wants to achieve that goal, but it's not just like, I'm coming here to do a job, you see? I'm here exactly. to tell a story. I'm, I'm an actor, I'm here to bring the story and, and I'm in service to the story. I'm, I'm working in wardrobe, I am in service to the story, that sort of thing. I think that understanding is missing from the training programs. It's, so it's more technical when you go to these training programs. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, I think, is probably something that needs to be looked at. If it's something that can be changed, even better. Yeah. So that brings me to the other question. What is about the censorship board now? Means, uh, is it still relevant today? Okay, censorship. <laughs> All right. So that's a difficult question a bit to answer, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, so personally, personally, I don't believe in censorship. That's, but that's a personal view, lah, right? But I do understand why the censorship board exists. I do understand because it's part of a government, uh, internal government policy, so I do understand why it exists. I do understand that there are uh, rating systems, like in the UK, you, you've got specific rating systems. I do think that the rating systems need to be applied accordingly. So say, for example, if it's a film that's meant for an 18 audience, you make sure that you rate it at 18. Lah. So, for example, if, if it doesn't deserve an 18 rating, then, you know, you just rate it as, a, as for a general audience. Like, the problem that I think arises with a censorship board is that some of the films that should be rated <laughs> lower get stamped with an 18 rating. That's where the grouses come from, especially from filmmakers. Lah. So it's like, uh, why did I get an 18 rating with all these cuts? I should have gotten something lesser than that. So it's those things that I think need to be sort of looked at. Right. So you think that, that, that uh, censorship is... is Relevant. Uh, um, again, it's a government policy. <laughs> I'm not so much to comment on, on, on government policies, but Personally, I don't really believe in censorship. I don't really understand, for example, uh, what it achieves, but that's more of a personal thing. But as far as the government policy is concerned, yeah, okay, so the reality is there's a, censor, there's a censorship board and all of the films that are made or the TV shows need to fall under some sort of censorship. The only thing is that perhaps the people doing the censorship need to look at what they're censoring. So that it really, so that it becomes, you know, if it's some sort of policy, it's something that's uh, effective. 
rather than something that's just, you know, arbitrary, you know, okay, I'm just going to give this guy an 18 rating or 21 rating. And, and they can't even argue why they gave it an 18 rating, that sort of thing. Also, it needs to get upgraded on a, on a regular perhaps, basis. Because perhaps, yeah. The world is changing. People are watching a lot of foreign stuff, which is easily available. And I think uh, for the censorship board, when they think something is very, it's not as per what their rules and regulations are, in a normal life, people are watching it on a regular basis and they don't think that it's, it's out of the norm. But then again, that's government policies. And, it's government uh, policy. Yes, yeah. and we don't have much <laughs> to say on that one. You as a scriptwriter and, and filmmaker, what were your unique challenges that you have faced while, uh, in Malaysia uh, while writing and, and directing shows? Uh, and how have you overcome those, those issues? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges really, Abid, if you ask me, is, uh, is producing content within a framework where you're st still censored as you mentioned just now. And so there's so many things that you gotta do. You gotta produce this content, it's gotta be great. It's gotta make uh, its margins back. It's gotta make some sort of profit. And yet at the same time, it fits a certain censorship policy. So the challenges are really that. And I hope that in the years to come, these sorts of things, it evolves. Uh, meaning, you know, uh, in terms of stories, we're able to tell more grounded, uh, more, perhaps, I, I don't know if controversial is the word, maybe it is. Maybe if we start creating more daring content, maybe that is the future and hopefully it can be supported by, you know, a government policy that allows for that. So because that's really a challenge right now, it's just having to, to, to deal with that. Um, at the same time, there's also the issue of budgets, you know. Um, Depends, of course. Uh, if the if the production is uh, demands a huge budget, then definitely it's something that we can work on. But if it's, you know, we're just trying to see if we can improve those budgets because cost of living goes up, all those kinds of things. So yeah, some of the challenges lah. Through the years, what we have seen as the quality of content has gone up, but uh, in comparison, the the budgets have gone down. Yeah. So. Uh, Tech, means technically, cameras are getting better, editing software is getting better, but the budget still is what it was 10 years ago. If you go to a broadcaster, and half an hour budget is still the same what it was 10 years ago. And also, uh, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is um, creating content is concerned, right? Is the amount of skilled writers that you have, the amount of skilled content creators that you need to produce right now. So that's a challenge that needs to come with a lot more training. You know, it's, it's definitely a lot more training, uh, training more writers, training more showrunners to be able to produce this sort of content. Yeah. But it's going to take time. <laughs> Obviously, good things will take time. At least there's a lot of learning from, 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 from everyday you know, production of new shows, creation of new content. I think there is a lot of learning and I think hopefully that will benefit the, the, the script writers as well as uh, the, the filmmakers from it. Once in Thief and Project Anchor SPM, can you tell us more about your experience working on these two projects and uh, what were your goals and visions for these projects? Okay, so Project Anchor SPM was created by a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, Anwari Ashraf. He was the showrunner for, the, for Project Anchor. I was, I was uh, one of the writers and I helped him uh, sort of figure out the writer's room, sort of guided him in how to develop the writer's room and stuff like that. So One Centif was the project that I did. So I created it, uh, developed it. Um, basically, the process was similar to the way I approach stories. So when I do a writer's room, what I do is um, I have a process called uh, writing the Bible. So I create the Bible before I enter a writer's room. What hap why I choose to do this is because I have been in many, many writers' rooms before where it's just people around the table and there's a whiteboard and then no one knows what we're going to do. So basically it becomes a process of ideation and I've been to many of those writers' rooms. So one day I just sort of like sat down and, and asked myself, 
how do I streamline this process, right? So, to my understanding, a writer's room is there to develop a story. You gotta come up with the story first, and then you come to the writer's room, and then you start developing it. So it requires a story bible before we enter the writer's room. So that's what I've been doing uh, at Astro Shaw uh, with a lot of their projects, whereby we have the bibles first, and then we go into the room uh, ready, and then we don't waste time. And there's a, a system of deliverables that has to be sent in every day. So in the first day, for example, we discuss what the theme of the story is. But we've got pretty much the premise and everything. We've got the outlines for each episode, just roughly, right? But I just want to know, okay, what is this story all about? Okay, then from there, we start building the characters, but based off of that theme. So the characters have a certain profile. They have uh, their wounds uh, that creates the things that they believe in and then leads to what they want, which is their primary motivators and what they need is if they arc. So all of these things need to be tied into the theme. Yeah, so that's pretty much the process. That's day one of my writer's rooms. Go into day two, then we have this whole tracker board where we start tracking each character across the whole season. And that one takes about, we, I've sort of refined the whole process. Now it's about a day an episode. We used to do those tracker boards, one whole tracker board a day. So we'd start at 10, we'd probably finish at 10 after 12 hours. But thinking about it now, we sort of go one episode per day. And we've not even broken down any of the episodes yet. So that comes later. So it's a, it's a process of basically just repeating. It's, it's, re it's basically repetition now of it. It's repetition. You've got the Bible, you break it down, and then you repeat the story to yourself. You refine it, you repeat the story to yourself. Yeah. I find that what happens is that now the writers will have, and especially the, whoever's show running the show, we'll have a better grasp of the story. Lah. And we've we got to do that before we start scripting. And then it goes to the scripts and so on and so forth. Lah. So with, 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 with shows like these, what was the vision and, and your goal when you, when you started creating the show? Have they been achieved by the end of the day? Because Once Night Thief was a phenomenal show. It was a great show, which I think uh, the masses just loved it. So means you just told me about the process, how you went through it. But when you're starting off with a project, how do you take it as, what's the goal and how do you achieve it and work towards it to, towards the end? How, how did it get uh, you know, achieved? So definitely the goal for creating a show or a film is definitely to get the story out there. To get the story out there in the best way possible, meaning whatever was created in the Bible, right? Whatever is written in the Bible, it goes through the whole development writer's room process and then it gets scripted and then it gets it goes into prep and then we produce and then we edit the goal is really to safeguard that original idea and take it all the way to post so i consider that the goal being if i am able to 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 translate whatever was written in the bible all the way to the edit I consider that a goal achieved. So that's pretty much what the goal is at the end of the day, to get whatever idea was pitched all the way to edit and it doesn't get lost in the translation. And to achieve that, it definitely requires a lot of uh, collaboration. Uh. So we've got the directors that we hire, the production house that we hire, all of the HODs that we hire, and getting everyone to sort of believe in the thing and contribute to the thing. and. If there's all these ideas that, that they have that, that's going to make the story better, why not? So, so that's the way I, I work. Lah. It's always a process of collaboration. Uh, obviously, and yeah. I think great stories are being told when you collaborate with, with the whole team and they have the same vision yeah. towards delivering a great product. Um, having said that, as an aspiring creator, what advice would you give to young and rebellious filmmakers and scriptwriters starting in the Malaysian industry? My advice would be to work, definitely. And when I say work, what I mean is, if you want to get into the industry, the only way to do it is to really get your foot into the door and start working. And when I say, and say a lot of people say, where do I start? How do I start working, right? It's actually a case of knocking on 
every door that you see, you know. It's really that. You gotta start knocking doors. Okay, so for example, if you watch TV and then there's a favorite show that you like, pay attention to who's the producer, which production house did it come out from. Try knocking on that door, you see? Try knocking on that door and more often than not, you will get a yes because people are always looking out for content, they're always looking out for writers. You will get the job, but you've got to do the homework. Like you've got to watch the shows, you've got to know which production house did it and contact that guy. They will contact you back. Most probably they will, here in Malaysia. Lah. It's not as tough as, I don't know about India, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's way tougher because it's a massive industry, but you know, not here in Malaysia. Lah. In Malaysia, it's really, yeah, it was, we're quite a small industry and, and we love uh, new guys <laughs> coming in. Yeah, yeah. We love new blood coming it, in. That's, I mean, that's what we do at Creators too. That's we really. get cold emails, we get cold calls, and we do invite them to come over, have us sit down and see what, what they want to do and how we can collaborate. That's awesome. And some of them have, have I mean, we, 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 we collaborated with those people and, and we were surprised that there's such great talent is there in the country. True. It's just that some, you, you have to knock doors. You have to when you're you starting. Yeah. So yeah, I, I completely agree with what you said uh, just now. Um, how important is cultural representation in your work and how do you ensure that diverse Malaysian voices and stories are included in your script? Well, for me, it's important because it's a representation of what, what the country is. So whenever I write a story, it's set here in Malaysia and it needs to represent, the characters at least, need to represent the reality of what I'm writing. And the reality of the world that I live in <laughs> is multicultural. My wife, for example, she's, <laughs> she's half Chinese, half Indian, half Malay. Well, one third Chinese, one third Indian, one third Malay. So, you know, and my friends come from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of cultures, all kinds of religions. So in terms of the work, in terms of the stories that I write, I think that's really important. There needs to be, if possible, a super equal kind of representation. I, I don't even understand why we need to talk about representation because at the end of the day, it really is the reality. It's, it's, it is, it's multicultural, it is. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think uh, that is very important in the story because everybody who's watching your show needs to get, you know, has to be emotionally connected to the story. Yeah, true. And that will only come if they see a part of them, part of them. In, 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 the, in the story, yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's the way to go where it comes to cultural representation. Uh, looking towards the future, what kind of impact do you hope to leave on the Malaysian film and television industry? And what does success look like to you? It's a very good question, Abed. Um, in terms of impact, I feel that perhaps what I would like to give really is, I would like to play a more educative role to be honest I, like I mean I've, I've, I've written I, I've produced and everything I'm thinking more of going into teaching perhaps to perhaps sort of leave that impact maybe an impact in terms of educating uh, you know the future writers future producers and stuff yeah success um, <laughs> I heard a quote, this is a quote from uh, one of the greatest comic book writers of all time, Mr. Alan Moore. So Alan Moore wrote uh, Watchmen and Swamp Thing and all that yeah. stuff, one of my favorites. So Alan Moore once said, in order to produce a work that, that has meaning, you got to do it, you got to get rid of two things. First is your fear of failure, okay? The second one is your desire for success. <laughs> so, so basically, so basically, you ask me about success. I'm, I'm not so sure because, and I'm trying to sort of absorb that philosophy into my life right now, to sort of take away fear of failure, and desire for success. Because according to Alan Moore, you take away these two things, the stuff that you do is gonna be somewhat important and somewhat pure. You know, because you don't really care about. Yeah you know, oh, it's gonna succeed, or you know, it's gonna make a billion bucks, and you know, you don't really care about failure because it becomes, okay, no one likes it, fine, but I'm still doing it anyway, that sort of thing. So I don't know about, I think success is if I'm, 
able to think that way, la, <laughs> the way Alan Moore thinks. If I manage to absorb that philosophy, I think that's that would be a great success. It's a hard one, but yes, if you can absorb it, it's <laughs> great. And looking at the crystal ball, means if tomorrow somebody comes and tells you that uh, I want one of the best shows made in Malaysia, budget is not an issue, what are you going to make? <sighs> that's a good one. <laughs> Probably something set in space, obviously. Oh, you are a space Because geek. I'm a huge science fiction <laughs> nut. <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, I definitely will set it in space, for sure. Across many worlds, across many realities, across many timelines, across many dimensions. Yeah, I will do that. We would love to see that because that's coming from, from Malaysia. I think that would be a very, very <laughs> unique and very, you know, entertaining. Also, um, you know, uh, people in, in our industry, people are still not thinking about space and stuff because they are more busy telling stories on ground rather than in space. But that, I'd love to watch that, what you make, if, if that happens one day. This year had been a really, you know, exciting year for, for content. Some great shows came out from a lot of streamers. Uh, great movies came out in the theaters and people thronged to, to, to watch those movies. And, you know, uh, there have always been something exciting where local content was in, in play. What are the five great uh, content pieces you've watched this year? It can be anything from local to international film or television. What do you th which are the, your favorite five which you think you've seen this, this year? year? Yeah. Okay, so far. Um, there's a show called Yellow Jackets. I really love it. Uh, it's an amazing show. I watched it this year. What else did I watch? It was great. Um, there's this film, it's a Danish film. It's a, it's a horror film. Well, not so much horror, it's about this... Uh, it's about a family that comes under... They, they, they visit another family, I think it's in Amsterdam, and, and it's a European family, and then they get besieged by that family. It's going to be turned into an American film, I think. I can't remember the title. Um, I saw this film called Infinity Pool by... Um, it's David Cronenberg's son who, who shot it. He's also twisted. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> as, twi as twisted as, as his father. Um, oh, what else did I watch this year? Oh, shoot. The Bear. The Bear was great. One of my favorites. Yeah, this The year. Bear was awesome. Um, what Both else? seasons, actually. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. Was there any new Star Wars shows? I can't remember if I watched it. Loki, Ahsoka. <laughs> Loki, Ahsoka. No, I, I didn't really enjoy those, Andor. actually. <laughs> Yeah, I probably can just give you four. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. With so many players in the market at this point of time, and every week there is a new binge-worthy content coming out, whether it's Netflix, Prime, View, Astro Shaw, Astro First. How are the local writers keeping up to it? How are the local filmmakers and, 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 and uh, producers are keeping up to it? And how it has impacted our local industry, I mean, in, in, in a good way uh, or, and in the bad way? How, how, does it, uh, how did it work? I think the impact has been huge uh, because of the level of skill that's required to produce these shows. And I don't mean just writers, directors of photography, your, your HODs, your, your, your audio, your makeup, your wardrobe. The competition that, that exists right now is that there are many there are so many shows that need to be done at a certain quality and the number of people who are able to do it has just, you know, we don't really have that many people. So the competition has just become greater because everyone just wants the same HOD right now. Everyone wants the same director of photography, everyone, everyone wants the same actors. So it's become, that's been the challenge lah so far because um, the demand is huge but the ability to feed that demand is still quite slow, actually. So yeah, the challenge has been everyone has been fighting over actors and, and HODs and stuff like that. So that's been a huge challenge. What are the solutions to that? Because I know the content pool is very small. Exactly. So what is the solution? Because again, we can't go out with the budgets we get here. We cannot take our stuff to, say, Indonesia or to India or... Not yet, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe one day. But... I Means that's the only option left because again, 
we are, what are we doing to increase this pool? Uh, from where are we getting this, these talents? Because again, our pool is so small. It is small. It's a case of us training. Uh, so and, and, and when we train people, I think when, when, even when, when, when people train themselves, they train themselves on the job, right? So with each job, new challenges arise, they learn more. And it's a matter of really going to all these jobs and learning stuff. I don't know if like workshops could probably help. I'm not so sure, maybe they can. But that's actually a good point. If Finas is doing workshops, then perhaps there should be workshops that can feed this particular uh, you know, appetite for, 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 for content right now. Where we, we need an increased talent pool. Because the talent pool, as you said, is quite small right now. Yeah. Uh I'm not drawing com comparisons, yeah. but uh, I, this year I was I was moderating a, a session in Indonesia, and I was sitting with some filmmakers and producers and broadcast platform guys, and and uh, one producer was doing twelve features and eight OTT titles uh, from one company, which is going to come out next year, as in, in 2024, and that's just one one company. And there are many like that in Indonesia where there's a huge consumption of content and all these big players want great content to be on their platform. When will that day come to Malaysia? Um, when... <laughs> okay, so with Indonesia, right, the market's huge. The market is massive. The market is something that the likes of Netflix are really looking at. They're investing in training in Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken, as well, right? It's a massive market. Um, our market is way smaller. We also have the added uh, challenge of having to navigate uh, censorship, which is a bit, a bit lax, if I'm not mistaken, in Indonesia. I mean, there, there is censorship, but it's not the same as what we have here, right? So. It's also a smaller, smaller market, and in terms of numbers, we are producing less than whatever is being produced in Indonesia, if I'm correct. Yeah, I, yeah. I have no idea. I, I mean, I would actually assume that, really, yeah, based, yeah. On, based on the number of uh, population, uh, stuff like that. So, when will we start seeing numbers like that? To be honest, I bet I don't even think we'll ever see numbers like that. I mean, if you sort of think uh, rationally, in terms of the, the country's population, ours and Indonesia, it's way different. That's number one. Number two, if you take sort of a comparison between the, the United States and somewhere smaller like the UK, it's still, the US still produces way more content compared to the UK. Yep. I mean, in terms of quality, both have great quality, but in terms of numbers, the UK still produces less compared to the US. So, yeah, I don't think... I think instead of focusing on the number of things that we do, I think we should start focusing on the quality of what we do. Like, slowly upskilling everyone and, and, and improving the quality of what we do. I think that's, for me, much more important, I think. Alfie, one thing which is becoming a, a new fashion and I would say it's an easy way out for broadcasters and streamers that uh, they're picking up formats from different countries, whether it's Korean, whether it's Indian, whether it's, you know, uh, American or British uh, format of dramas and bringing it to Malaysia and then localizing it and, and making into uh, producing into a local language and with local sensitivities. What are your views on that? Because uh, there are a lot of original stories we need to be told, which are locally, you know, developed and that local writers have written. In. Uh, is it fair to make adapting uh, adaptations uh, over originals? And if so, why? So, in the first place, I think we need to understand why adaptations happen. So there are adaptations of formats and and great formats actually. Right? So, when a format is adapted, it's, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer because the format has succeeded and now it's about bringing that particular format into the local space, into the local market. And I have absolutely no objection to that. I feel that uh, adapting formats are a great thing only because uh, even as writers, 
there's so much to learn from this format. So training writers to adapt formats, I think is a good thing, should be done. And I have, for me, I don't see anything negative about it, to be honest. On that question, I will ask you, when will our originals be adapted into uh, <laughs> the foreigners are going to take our, uh, our stories? That, I think, would depend on the quality of what we produce. So I think the ball is back, the ball rolls back to our court. And the ball, and basically what it asks us is simply, is what we're producing good? And, and that is a huge question that we need to ask ourselves. Is what we are producing, you know, uh, great or good enough to penetrate into other markets? That's a question that we got to ask ourselves, right? And I think it's also the question that lingers behind, you know, in the heads of all creators who, who create shows or who even like produce films and all. How great is this thing that we're doing that's going to penetrate one day somewhere else, right? So... That day so, will yeah, happen? Yeah. It will if we, if we really, you know, get together and... Okay, Abit, I think what you're doing is great in terms of having a show, an initiative whereby you get the industry to talk about things. I think it's initiatives like this that are great. Because the thing is, Malaysia, everyone operates in a vacuum, you see? Like, for example, I could be a writer and I know that there's this guy named Abit, but I've never met him. Right. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I'm meeting yeah. you today. But imagine all the stuff that Alfie and Abit could probably do in the future. Yep. Because you know there's a space to, to meet up and a space to collaborate. I think more of that is needed. A lot of talking yeah. needs to lot, happen. Yeah, a lot of talking needs yeah. to happen, a lot of back and forth, a lot of debate, a lot of uh, yeah, just sharing ideas and stuff like that. On that note, I think I would like to thank you, Alfie, for coming and having this great conversation. And I hope one day we will be able to collaborate on something great, which uh, the world is going to adapt in their own lo local language. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Abed, for having me. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this exciting episode. And we can't thank Alfie enough for joining us on What's Doing. Send us your comments on the podcast, on the details given in the podcast link. Tune into the next episode of another thought provoking podcast episode of What's Stewing. Till then, keep stewing. Mm -hmm.